This episode of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Hello and welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen and this is your weekly dose of Technolust. Shannon Morris is at CES currently, but she will be joining us later in the episode with some awesome stuff about Arduinos and LEDs. And I figured that I would just go ahead and jump right into it because we have been having an amazing discussion about virtualization and the comments and the forums. And I love all of the input. And this brought me back to thinking about, you know, KVM and OpenVZ, these are awesome projects. And it really stirred up this like one that I had shelved for a while that I kind of need to get going for a trip here soon. And I was like, dude, this is a perfect opportunity to talk about Ubuntu Linux on a Chromebook using a CH-rooted environment. Now, Chromebooks, you if you haven't seen them, these things are pretty awesome. They are light, they're cheap, they run Chrome, they run SSH kind of where it ends. Actually, I have one booted up right here, and you can see if you do Control-Alt-T, it's kind of epic that you can just get yourself right into a shell, you know, bloop, and uh, Crush. Crush is cool. You can type help and see there's, well, not a whole lot of options here. We can ping stuff, and we can SSH into things, which is cool, but you know, it's it would be nicer if we would have like a full Linux environment, something with all of the tools that we're used to. And this is where Crouton comes in. Crouton is, they call it an acronym. It stands for the Chromium OS Universal CH Rooted Environment. And it's a set of scripts that makes it really easy to deploy um, Linux. Specifically, they've got it set up for Ubuntu and Debian on Chromebooks uh, in a CH Rooted environment, which is rad. Now, and this kind of ties in with OpenVZ in the way that CHrooted is a Unix tool that allows for like an isolated file system. It's used by OpenVZ project in addition to many other things to create independent on environments on top of a single kernel, which is what we're going to be doing today. What it means is that the application is running running within the CH rooted environment. Typically, typically can't see outside of their own container. It's kind of sort of like a sandbox. But um, what we end up with here is both, not like a dual booting situation, more like a simultaneous like Chrome OS and Ubuntu, in this case, utilizing the same resources. So the same RAM, the same CPU simultaneously, but each within their own independent file systems. So for this, I'm going to be demoing this using the HP Chromebook 11, uh, but basically any Chromebook will be supported in this case. And I love the HP Chromebook 11. It's about a year old, and it's not lightning fast or anything, but this thing is super light. Under the hood, dual core 1.7 gigahertz ARM. So already tons of battery life on it because of that. Two gigs of RAM, not much, not upgradable either. Uh, only a 16 gig SSD. So, I mean, nothing brilliant, but you know, it's enough to run the basic Linux stuff that I miss, like the Bash utilities, and best of all, it's only two pounds. Um, if you've been paying attention for a while, you'll remember that last time I went to Europe, I complained a lot about the uh, like eight pound Lenovo that I brought. So maybe this is where that came from. Um, but best of all, it runs off of micro USB. I wish more laptops would get in on this game. There's actually a specification for USB to do I think it's up to 60 watts of power. So that's kind of rad. I just love the idea of being able to run my laptop off of a uh, pineapple juice or actually all of the equipment in my bag for that matter. Um, so to get started, what you'll need is to put your Chromebook in developer mode. If you have an older model, there's probably a hardware switch. The newer ones, you can do this in software. There's a three finger salute that's holding down escape, refresh, and power. So I'll go ahead and do that here and hope that Paul, this stays on your camera, so escape, bloop, the bloop. And we get this Chrome OS missing or damaged, please insert a recovery stick. Paul, do you get that? Nope, okay. Well, it looks sort of like that, okay? Scary screen, it doesn't make any mention of this here, but what you'll have to do is hit Control D and we've pressed enter and then control D and the system is now going into developer mode. You basically have to wait here. There's not much you can do about it. It takes about 10 minutes and it's going to wipe the disk. And while it wipes the disk, we're gonna have a nice little logo wipe. Huh? And once everything is wiped, we will be welcomed to setting up our Chromebook as if it was uh, brand new. Now the first step after we've logged in is to go ahead and download the Crouton installer. You can always grab the latest version from, here we go, HTTPS, ah, come on. 
Did I mention it's slow? And now we can go ahead and open up Crosh with Control Alt T. And what's nice here is, is unlike before, we can actually issue shell. So we're in developer mode. And there we are. We are at localhost. And if we go into our download folder, which is, let's see, in slash home slash, what is it, user or root? It's not root. Hang on. It is whatever our current user is. So that would be in what user? That's interesting. Actually, hang on. Let me just do CD and then PWD. Haha. -ha. Okay. Home and then Kronos user. There we go. And now, ah, that was going to be the next step. <laughs> it's downloading all of my extensions. So anyway, while it downloads all the extensions in the background, I'm going to go into the downloads directory here. And you'll see that we have, OK, it's installing all of the extensions. Sorry about that. So if I do an ls, we can see we have our crouton. And then all we have to do is actually execute this with sh. So for that, we will need root or root. It's fine. So issue sudo sh and then crouton. Or I guess in this case, it's going to be dot slash because I'm in its directory. And what we can do is give it a tack t list and tack r list. So here we've listed our releases as well as our targets. And I'm going to go ahead and install Ubuntu 14.04 because uh, I love the long-term support additions. So that is trusty. And I'm going to go ahead and install that with XFCE. You could, if you wanted to, run Unity. I don't see why you would want to on an ARM processor, but uh, so we're going to go with something lightweight like XFCE. And actually, if you want, you can just bypass all of the um, all of the GUIs completely and just go ahead and, and download uh, the CLI version, and then you can just like pop into Bash, which is fantastic. For that, just do tac T, and I think it's CLI dash extras or just CLI. Oh, I'm sorry, Core, Core or CLI dash extras. So for this, what I will issue is I want uh, TAC E for encrypted and then TAC R for trusty, the latest version of Ubuntu, LTE. And then for my targets, it's going to be uh, ZWI, XIWI, extension, and XFCE. And we'll come back to ZWI and extension in a second. Oh. Right. OK, so because we've asked it to do it uh, encrypted, we'll have to set up some passwords. So we'll go ahead and give it a good password. And now we have to choose the past phrase for our actual Linux install. Within that, it's going to go ahead and generate our key. So move the mouse for some entropy, goodness. And there we go. And after that long and laborious installation routine, we pretty much just give it a username and a password twice. And there we go. Now, here's what's epic. Uh, we can pretty much just go ahead and launch into uh, the rooted environment by doing a sudo enter chroot. Ah, sudo enter dash chroot. And check that out. I am DK at localhost. And you'll notice that this is a completely different file system. If I ls tag la slash, uh, this is not the same file system as the Chromebook, which is fantastic. That's how our uh, you know, system is running. And now I've got you know, Bash and all of the other tools that I would love to be able to use on my Chromebook. And I can get to it simply by hitting Control at T and opening up a tab of, um, of Crosh, which is the command line shell for uh, Chrome. However, I would probably like to get into the GUI at some point, And that's simply a matter of issuing start xfce4. So that's going to go ahead. And you'll notice here it says retrying. And the reason for this is one of the targets that I installed was the Crouton integration extension here. So you can find this in the Chrome extension market, play, or whatever it's called. And when you click that in the top right, what you'll see is, Loading. 
I'm going to use the default configuration, and huzzah, I have XFCE. And I've got, you know, um, Bash and my file system and all of the other tools. And I can go ahead and do like a pseudo app to get installed DOSBox and start playing DOS games on my CH-rooted Linux environment on my Chromebook and all sorts of other fun things like that, which is epic. And what's really great here is um, we can actually see if I go ahead and hit exit here this is just running within a window so if I alt tab I'm back to Chrome and what's so great about installing this crouton integration extension here is what this guy does is makes it so that you know copy and paste between these if I, if I actually select all of this and do a copy I can now go into my terminal and paste I spoke too soon <laughs> well I had it working um, but the idea is that this goes ahead and synchronizes Chrome and your CH-rooted Linux environment so that the clipboard is shared and also so that links to say uh, there's no need to then install Chrome on your CH-rooted Ubuntu environment because you, know, you already have Chrome. So it makes it so that URLs will actually open in Chrome's Chrome that makes any sense, which is kind of epic, and I love having the option to, you know, bounce into a very minimal Ubuntu installation, but have the ability to get those tools, even if it is on a slow machine. I love it. I think it's pretty rad, and I would love to hear your feedback on it. So go ahead and hit us up, feedback at hack5.org. Let us know what you think, and uh, we will be back in just a bit. Doesn't matter if you're into CH roots or bare metal, when that killer idea hits, you're gonna need to snag yourself a domain name and web hosting fast. And with Domain.com's quick domain discovery system and their easy checkout process, you're gonna have your website up and running in no time. I love Domain.com because they're reliable, affordable, easy to use, but most of all, because they are so much fun to do business with. They're active on social media. You can hit them up at Domain.com and see why. They just make you know a really fun place to do business. And the guys over at Domain.com Huge fans of Hack5, they want to hook you up, so they've got this coupon code, very easy to remember. It's H-A-K-5, that spells Hack5, and at checkout, if you use that at Domain.com, you're going to get extra 15% off. So when you think domain names, think Domain.com. It's time for the trivia question of the week. Our last trivia question was, what multi-purpose compiled language designed in 1983 was super popular in the 90s and has influenced several other languages? And the answer is, it's probably kind of obvious, C++. Now this week's trivia question is, who is the term voltage derived from? It's kind of easy. Answer that over at hack5.org slash trivia for your chance to win some awesome Hack5 goodies. I decided to start off 2015 in a cool, very fun way with more of my Arduino segments. So first off, with this year, I would like to get started with LEDs because LEDs are a really important feature of a whole lot of circuitry that you guys will probably want to build because, hey, they're fun and they're pretty and there's lots of different colors and they do blinky blinky things. And who doesn't like blinky blinky things? So LEDs, that stands for light emitting diodes. These are diodes that can be found everywhere. You can find them in like your cell phone or I could find them on the camera that I'm currently recording on or they might even be on the headlights in a car that you might buy new LED lights on there so they're really really popular you can find them pretty much everywhere but they're basically a diode is this little device that makes current flow from one positive side which is called the anode to a negative side which is called the cathode and not vice versa luckily vice versa doesn't really work now the positive side the anode of an LED is the longer leg I have a whole bunch of ones here so let me get one out for you if we take a look at this little red LED, you can see it has two sides to it. It's kind of hard to see on there, but you can sort of see it. There's a longer leg, that one's the anode, and then the shorter leg over here is called the cathode. Now the shorter one is negative, the longer one is positive, so keep that in mind. Now if you plug in an LED backwards, luckily it just doesn't work because if it did work, it would probably blow up or screw it up in some way. But luckily, no power can swoop up into the cathode side. It just comes out the cathode side, so the negative side. It always has to come through the anode side. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. Now, diodes usually transmit energy, and that energy turns into some kind of heat, and it just gets kind of released and then up into the atmosphere. But LEDs, on the other side, they create energy, which is released as light, hence light-emitting 
diodes. Now, LEDs drain current the brighter that they are. So if you are running off of a battery, a super bright LED will drain it faster than a lower powered LED. And LEDs are measured for a certain amount of power. So if you let it have too much power, it can end up blowing up or it can burn out. And you basically know that it's dead, Jim, because the LED blinks and then it just turns off and nothing happens after that. Or it might smoke or maybe it pops or it just doesn't light up whatsoever, and then obviously the thing's broken and you have to get a different LED, but luckily they're all like a few cents, so they're very, very cheap. Now try turning it around if the power consumption is backwards, so luckily, hopefully you just put in the ground side on the wrong side. You can just switch, them, switch the two legs around and hopefully it'll be good then. Adding a resistor also can keep your LED from eating up way too much power. Now there are a lot of sites on the internet that recommend starting around 330 ohms for a resistor, but you can also do the math that we learned on the resistance episode of Hack 5. Either way, if your LED isn't as bright as it should be, or the resistor is hot to the touch, you're probably resisting too much power, so lower the resistor value. Now I did want to mention something as well on my computer over here. I found a nice handy graph over on Google, because Google's amazing. This shows you a little graph of an LED. So the longer side is the anode, the shorter side is the cathode. Cathode is negative, anode is positive. You also notice this right here. Now if you're ever, ever looking at a schematic, you'll notice it's kind of like an arrow. It goes from one end, the anode side, the positive side, over to the negative cathode side. And this arrow has two little teeny tiny arrows pointing out of it. That means that it is a light emitting diode. If it did not have those two little arrows pointing out of it, it would just be a normal diode, like one you would find on the inside of circuitry instead of something that lights up bright and cool, like blinky little LED lights. You'll always notice that the anode side is the one that should be pointing from positive. The cathode side should be the one that's pointing negative. That's where the power is always going to go, is the cathode side. Now, if you're not sure if an LED works, if you plug it in to your Arduino and it just ends up not doing anything, it could be dead, but there's also a really easy way to test it out. Now, there are these little batteries called CR2032 batteries. So those are like the little ones that you would find in watches or you could find them at convenience stores like Walgreens and stuff like that. You can just stick them between the two little legs and clip them together, kind of pinch them in there with the plus side of the battery touching the anode side. So the longer side and the negative side touching the cathode. So you'll pinch it together and it should light up because that is just enough power to make a little LED light up. Hey, that's kind of cool and simple. And then you could stick like a magnet on it and throw it at things and make it stick and you'll have LED blinky lights all over your warehouse. I totally didn't do that. Moving on to choose your LEDs, it's a really good idea to take a look at the data sheet that comes with it. Now, there are a ton of LEDs that you can choose from. I have a graph up here that I also found on Google, and it shows you a bunch of different sizes. There's a whole bunch of different colors. There's the little itty bitty ones that you usually find inside of smaller electronics. There's large ones that you can find on breadboards, such as this big yellow one and this white one and the red one. And then there's also other ones that are clear. There's a bunch of different kinds that you can purchase for whatever you need them to do. Now it's very important to understand the data sheet that you can usually find on a website where you purchase these from. So I found an LED that I want to buy. It's called this violet five millimeter LED. It's 50 cents, you know, it's a good price and it's violet. And I read the reviews. They all say that it actually looks like violet. It's so pretty. So there's this little data sheet here. So I can click on that and it takes me over to this thing that's written in Chinese. Now the Chinese part doesn't really help me obviously, but there is this nice little graph and it explains everything about the LED that you'll need to know whenever you're working with it. So if we take a look at this graph, now let's scroll down a little bit on this data sheet and you'll find this nice little graph. And this graph has some pretty interesting information on it. Now first off, we have this forward current. So this is the maximum rating of a current that you can get out of this LED. So it says in milliamps, you'll get 20 milliamps. If you want it to just do something like blinking at a really, really bright color, and a whole bunch of times, but you don't want to leave it on for a long, long time, you can use this peak forward current, which is rated at 30 milliamps. But if you don't want it to burn out over time, if you don't, if you just want to leave it on forever or something like that, the suggested use, using current is 16 to 18 milliamps. Now that information is all really, really important when we get into some math. The rest of this you don't really have to pay attention to unless you're soldering or unless you're in really extreme temperatures like you live in Antarctica or something. Now, 
Maximum ratings, these are also very important. The forward voltage, this is going to be rated in volts. And this is going to be a minimum of 3.0 to 3.6. Depending on which color and which size LEDs you get, that's going to vary a lot. So you might find some like I have some red LEDs that came in this little pack that are 1.8 to 2.2 volts. So very, very important to check that before you do anything with them. You also notice down here there's a wavelength. The wavelength is going to tell you in nanometers uh, what color it's going to end up being. So 395 to 400 will be violet and luminous intensity. So this, it looks like McDonald's, but it's actually Mila Candela. That's the luminosity of your LED, and that's gonna be rated at 100 to 180 for the luminosity, how bright it's going to be. And last off, of course, you have viewing angles because not all LEDs will be able to be viewed from every single angle if you're looking at it. And if we scroll down a little bit more, you don't need to pay attention to this graph right here, but this is also important if you decide to put this into any kind of electronics, you probably wanna know what size it is. And here's a nice little angle graph of exactly what viewing angles you would be able to see this violet LED from. So it's pretty narrow, but it's decent. And yeah, the rest is just about their shipping containers. So we don't wanna deal with all that information. So moving on, LEDs, they come in all sorts of different shapes, sizes and everything, but that data sheet is always very, very important. Now, ones that I did want to mention as far as different kinds, there's RGB ones that have four legs instead of just two, uh, one for each of the different colors that you can get and you can mix the intensities, you can change the colors so you can have like a whole rainbow of millions of different colors. There's also flashing LEDs that have integrated circuits inside of them to make them flash. SMD LEDs, which are tiny surface mountain, mounted ones that have little pads instead of legs. So you would probably find those robots making those in warehouses, not like this warehouse. There's also high powered LEDs, like what you find in fancy headlights and flashlights, things like that. And then there's also uh, IR LEDs for remotes, such as turning your TV on and off that uses an IR LED and UV LEDs for ultraviolet. Now, last off, it's time for some math. Are you ready? Because I am. Okay, so this is the fun part. I have a board that gives me five volts of power. Anything else on my board has to share that whole voltage for my whole circuit to work. So it can't go over five volts ever. It always has to be under five volts. So let's say that I have two LEDs. So I might have, let's say I have two red LEDs. This is just example talk. I have two LEDs and both of these are rated at 2.4 volts max for their forward voltage. So this was on that graph again. I would want to add a resistor with 0.2 volts being absorbed through it to equal the power because that's the difference. So you have 2.4 plus 2.4, that's 4.8, plus a resistor with 0.2 volts, that equals five volts total. So you always wanna have five volts going in and five volts going out. Now this is called, and I might say it wrong, Kirchhoff's law. I hope I said that right. Kirchhoff? Kirchhoff's law. Is he German? I don't know. I should probably look that up. Now for my violet LED, I would need a 280 ohm resistor. So I could just do the math for this. This is Ohm's law. Five volts divided by 0 0.018. So that 18 equals 277. And I just rounded up to 280 because it's a little bit easier. Now it gets a little bit more complicated if you want to limit the current to a certain degree. So let's take our violet LED again. And this time we're gonna use a nine volt battery. So if we look at our spreadsheet, our data sheet, it says forward voltage is rated at three volts. So the minimum is three, maximum is 3.6. So I'm gonna calculate it via the minimum voltage that it needs. Uh, I want to limit the current of electricity to this LED to 16 milliamps. And I chose 16 because that's the suggested usage, usage current that I want to use. So I would take my nine volt battery and I would subtract the three volts for forward, forward voltage, volts. And that equals six volts. Now after that, I divide that by 0 0.016 because 0 0.016 is the milliamps uh, that I want to use, the usage current. Now, that will equal my resistor ohms, like how many ohms I need. So I would want a resistor that's around 375 ohms. Now that's pretty darn close to the average of 330 ohms that you generally would need. Now last off, 
I did get a lot of people asking about this and commenting on YouTube, so I decided to go ahead and mention it. Do you need a resistor? So it's kind of an argument. There's a lot of people that say no, not necessarily. There's a lot that say yes. Now the safe answer is yes. I didn't use one for my previous example because I didn't need one for that example. Now I'll give you a quote exactly from Arduino's website because this is kind of important when it comes to Arduinos. So, can I plug an LED into a Duino without a resistor? The answer is yes, although not necessarily the best of techniques. An at mega pin can only supply about 40 milliamps, which is not enough current to damage standard LEDs, which is what I was using for my example. A better choice would be a series resistor of a value between 100 ohms and 1K. Using that math, you'll be able to figure out if you need 100 ohms, 1K, 230, 330, whatever it might end up being, connected between the LED and the ground. So that information is very, very important. It's always important to understand how much power you're getting out of your pins and if this is going to end up screwing up your LEDs. So I think that about explains LEDs and all the fun times that you can have with them. Make sure that you pay attention to the math for doing your resistors if you need resistors for your calculations, of course. I think I'm gonna go build things with these. I know I got a robot in the mail, so my, maybe I'll put LEDs on my robot. I guess we'll find out. Stay tuned, of course. You can email me feedback at hack5.org if you have questions about LEDs and resistors and all the calculations that you need to do to make sure that you're building your circuitry correctly. Stay tuned. We're gonna take a break. That just about wraps up this week's episode of Hack 5. But before we get going, I wanted to thank you all for participating in the Hack 5 LAN party. This was an awesome uh, success of our first beta test of like, hey, let's pack a bunch of people in the warehouse and play Unreal Tournament until we're blue in the face. And that's what we did. And it was a lot of fun. And we learned a lot of things about how like warehouses are cold at night and stuff like that. But otherwise, it was kind of rad. And I think we're going to do another even bigger, mega huge one in the summer. So stay tuned for details on that. Um, and you know lots of other fun projects in the works uh, so uh, with all of that you can find all the ways to follow and subscribe over at hak5.org that's where you can always have your hack 5 delivered to you at hak5.org or just google hack 5 um, there's revision3.com slash hack 5 as well sometimes they post episodes of hack 5 sometimes they don't otherwise um, with that and for Shannon who's now at CES I'm reminding you to trust your technolust I am starting off 2015, right? It's 2015, isn't it? Okay, it's not 2014 anymore. Okay, good. I'm starting this year off correctly and I'm going to get back in, let me start it over.